Right, let's have a look at our template from the session before this. We have the beginnings of a magazine cover, but it is boring. It has no clear sense of identity. It has no real house style other than only using one font to Homer throughout the whole thing. Now, one of the things we need to do with our magazines, uh, I'm going to be doing my fashion magazine today, but you're going to be doing probably your um, magazines for current affairs, is we need to think about our logos and mastheads and really getting a strong sense of house style. And I'm just going to show you this here. If we have a look at a fashion magazine, Marie Claire. Now, we know with Marie Claire that it's got this sort of lowercase sans serif, slightly angled um, fonts on its masthead and throughout the whole thing as you can see here we've got these sans serif kind of thin fonts right that's its look it knows what its masthead is someone an agency would have been paid thousands of pounds to go and develop its branding uh, and design that font for them to make sure it all has its own internal logic and then they would have had a look at which fonts they would use as part of their house style right so a very limited palette of fonts is what you're going to be looking for in the course of your magazine and the same thing would be true if we have a look at something like the spectator let's go and put that one there make that a little bit larger right and you can see with this one that it's got a much more formal style but it's got this sharp red serifed font for the masthead here and it tends to have the continuation of this sort of serifed font throughout the main cell line and the little sub lines that go with it interestingly when they get to this sort of banner at the top they ditch the serifs it all goes a bit more bold a bit more sans serif and that's really got to do with these sort of connotations of modernity rather than sort of tradition and power that you have in the main um magazine front cover because at the top here it's free inside spectator health nap your way to the top and uh, with that there it's got its kind of connotations of health there almost like that kind of nhs kind of blue color that they use and that those connotations of modernity with the sans serif look so you've got to be able to say these are my serif fonts if i'm going to use them these are my sans serif fonts if I'm going to go and use those and do not underestimate just how detailed they are about the colors and fonts that they choose. And this is how detailed it is. In fact, um, they really do go to town. They can have whole booklets on these things if you work in a professional company. Um, where you are literally saying you can and can't use certain colors, you can and can't use certain colors with each other, but you can use them at other times when they're not with each other, um, and certain particular fonts as well. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to supply you with this, but hopefully you'll see just how detailed they go. At the bottom here, we have our three main fonts that they use. So you might say all oh, your headlines are going to be in Helvetica New, in bold size 56 that could be a standard thing but your body text could be in a smaller uh, point size but in helvetica new light but the, those relative sizes would change depending on if you were looking in a truly small body text on a you know on an article rather than maybe a contents page or something like that or a web page it depends but certainly there's a helvetica new thing going on in terms of the main body text and things around it and in terms of the main branding of it we have our dope style font right uh, and maybe they have the byline in that dope style font to give it those sort of connotations of kind of coolness and sort of urban you know that kind of urban coolness i think and we've got kind of this almost sporting urban kind of connotations that we have here now how are we going to have a look at this how can we turn ourselves into a you know, from a boring to homer font into this use of dope style to create this real strong sense of branding and you can see that in the top left hand corner we've got the all about me font that uh, we have constructed and said yep that's what it's going to look like and there's going to be times where you can have the stroke on the outside and they will say how thick the stroke is they'll say oh it's always using a five point outside stroke of a tertiary color now what we're going to find is we're going to have 
two main colors. You're gonna have a white version of the logo and a black version of the logo for your own product. And you might decide to have a, a third color, maybe a red or a pink or something like that. But we need to know what the core of it is. And you'll notice that the core of the logo, and this would very much be considered the masthead of your magazine, will always be the same. So you have the black version at the top, you have the stroke version, the second one down, and then you have like the alternative version with the stroke, same width at five points, but then you have maybe a fade through it, and maybe a fade is one of the design sort of house style conventions that they will use in a magazine. And this gives it a really tight look. Now a really important thing to have a look at is down here in the bottom right hand corner where they have this group of colours that they decide are going to be part of their branding. Now with a magazine that can change on issue to issue bases. Um, but at the same time you might find something like the Economist or the Spectator will always go with like a very strong red um, at, it, at its masthead. Now the numbers and the numbers and the digits next to them you will see that we have a white a black an orange and a purple and they won't just use maybe an rgb red green blue fader that you have in photoshop they will know exactly what color it is according to a scale such as pantones but more likely in a digital space they're going to use what's known as hexadecimal codes six digits numbers and letters help decide exactly for the whole of computer language across the world what that color is. White is FF, FF, FF. Black is 00, 00, 00, 00. zero, zero. But the orange is, oh, FF9933. And the purple is CC66, CC. And these can be very odd configurations of digits. But the point being that you want to get to the point where you can absolutely know what your limited color palette is because you don't want one red on one of your magazine covers and a slightly different red on your other magazine cover you want it to be proper tight throughout the entirety of your production pieces so when you lay them all out in front of you be like that looks like one really consistent brand both in terms of color and in terms of font and that's where that real sense of uh, continuity um, across your platforms will be really good for you and that will reflect positively in your marks in terms of having a cross media synergy between your print products be it the contents page and the magazine cover and also your website where you're going to want to see these things exactly the same let's go and set ourselves up a document so that we can make a new masthead or logo as it would be referred to on the website and with this we're going to create a real sense of how style and what we'll do is we'll have something that's repeatable and be able to be used maybe in the top left hand corner of a website and at the top of a magazine cover and somewhere maybe towards the top of our contents page and we're going to move towards having a real strong sense of branding so let's go and open up photoshop and we're going to open up a new document we're going to go to file at the top and we're going to go to new and with that we're going to make ourselves a new document now we want to make something that if it's a logo it's probably going to be more landscape than portrait but we want to give ourselves enough pixels to work with again as we saw in the last video so if we go to international paper a4 but what we'll do this time is we're going to have a look at the pixels that that creates and that's quite a lot there look you'll see that if we had an a4 document that was portrait that we've got there then it's going to be less wide than it is long but what i'd like to do let's go and make it something a bit like that i'm going to make mine 3500 by 2004 and we will end up probably chopping this down to be more efficient with this as well I'm going to go and put this in 250 dpi as last time because that's fine although we will be making a very large very detailed masthead like this that's going to be a couple of thousand pixels across I and mean, you won't need that for your website the print dots per inch is about 250 300 dpi 
that will give you the most possible pixels. But when you are doing something for a logo online or on a computer, your screen only really displays about 72 dots per inch. What's really important is that it's better to start with more pixels when you first design the thing and then squish it down to a smaller size of image afterwards. And then that will give you much more malleability, but also won't allow you to use massive images on a web-based sort of web page or something like that because then you'll always be constantly trying to squeeze these massive images down also when you're hosting your website it's a lot of data and it can be really slow and creaky for your computer and also their servers if you've got these big images when you just need an image that's a much lower dots per inch um, now another way of thinking about dots per inch is pixels picture cells and that most of our computer screens are about sort of 1920 across by 1080 down um, and that's you know something that's if you think about that that's much much less than having the many uh, many thousands of pixels that we've got here say 3005 by 2004 so let's go and make ourselves a document name let's go and call this uh, masthead large trial so we know we're gonna make it large this is a trial just for you guys we're gonna go back to our contents uh, background content and go to transparent because we want that first of all and we will go and make ourselves something that is landscape rather than portrait let's just quickly command minus to zoom out and we've got something landscape rather than portrait with this checkerboard white and gray transparency thing behind it and the first thing we're going to go and do is we're going to get our free layer like so we're going to just click on that um, naming uh, box down there in the layers channel and call it green bg for green background exactly like we did last time because this is going to be super important what you don't want to be doing is making white logos on a whitey grey background you won't see it properly and it will be painful we need a horrible color that we can definitely provide relief with and always be able to see the white and black of our logo that we are going to create so let's go and get our paint bucket we have selected our layer over here green background and we are going to fill it up and there she is so now we're ready to go and get some fonts in we like and make ourselves a logo we have a good workspace there we need to bring in an interesting font now I'm going to be doing some kind of fashiony kind of font and the fonts that you normally have sitting there in your directories are not the ones you want to use okay they're pretty functional you're going to look for something more artistic so let's go online to a font website and we will find ourselves some fonts we're going to get those fonts but it won't be enough just to get the fonts we'll have to import them and we'll type them in and then we're going to mess with them because there are many reasons why this is the case first of all you want to make something uniquely branded but also it tends to be that the letters are too far apart when you type them in just to do with the fine details of the letter spacing now i'm going to go to the font and that's a popular font website there's also things like a thousand and one fonts.com but the font will do me fine for now and there are these websites here where you get free fonts um, that the community has made god bless the internet and we're going to have a look for something that's quite formal maybe quite stylish uh, you know it's no point having anything sort of distorted or destroy or horror as you can see down here i mean you can find anything any kind of font really on these websites but we want something that's kind of cool and kind of on trend so let's have a look for something like let's go techno lcd let's try that see if we can quite modern maybe a bit too techno here uh, let's go and find something a little bit more um, typewritery what have we got here there we go something that really does work within you know it, the connotations are that which it says they are so you can start to see sort of the ink smudges of a typewriter for example I'm looking for something oh cool maybe badly stamped something like that or old newspaper type something like that um, something where I'm going to be quite interested in the look of it smart chameleon now that looks kind of cool smart chameleon looks kind of cool and it also looks quite spread out and you're going to see why this is something you need to deal with when you make your own 
front covers and logos because you don't want your letters too spread out. You're going to have to play a bit of a game where you get them back in. So I'm going to download this now. Now my download should be in my downloads folder and I can also have a look at it down here. Let's have a look, show in finder and there we have smart chameleon zip. Whenever you get some kind of font downloaded, it will come as a zipped up zip, something that's been compressed. And then we're gonna to have to double click on that to open that one up and it will give you a TTF. That's pretty much what you're looking for there. Uh, and with the TTF, this is a file type that's associated with font data. There's some other ones as well, like OTPs and whatnot, but whatever the contents are of the zip, that's what you want. And then you're going to go up to the top right hand corner to font book. Now, font book is where it is on a Mac. If I go to the spyglass in the top right and type in font book, and when you guys get on our Macs as well, you will find the same thing. Open that up and you will see that it's got all of the fonts that are already installed on the system all put in alphabetical order. And all we need to do is go and drop Smart TTF into that list. And once it's in there in font book, the whole of the system will see it. Word will see it, PowerPoint will see it, InDesign will see it, and Photoshop will see it. And then we can use that going forwards. So now we can go back across to Photoshop and see what we have. So go to T, make a nice big text box, much larger than the amount of text that you're going to go and put in because it will not push the box out. It will just stop you having a decent look at your font. Now we're also going to make sure it's nice and large um, when we first type because we've got a lot of, lot of pixels here. We're across to 3,400 pixels and we're going to change the color of what we're writing. And I'm going to start with a nice clean white. So you can see your cursor here sort of flashing in that sort of top left hand corner and we can start to type in there the font that we want. Now I've got to Homer and I'm going to go and call my magazine, let's have a look, top Top Garms, that's awful, isn't it? Um, let's go and use um, Top Kit. Let's have a look. There we go. Top Kit. That'll do. It's fashion. It doesn't matter. You're going to see what I do with it anyway. Um, so we've got that there, and then we're going to go to Tahoma and change that for our new font. And with our font here, we know that it begins with an S smart chameleon there it is and we can go and change the font straight away and there it is changed so we know we've got it in through font book and now photoshop is seeing it at the moment it's far too small so we need to make this much much larger to make a font larger we can go to the top here we have the drop down menu but that's not going to be enough we can go in and type in a font size so let's go and type in something quite mahusive. Let's go and put 160, see what we get. In fact, we can probably go a little bit larger than that. Really very large. We are trying to create something that is generating a great deal of pixels that we can then go and use, right? And top kit, there we are. We're, we're happy with that. That's looking good. And now it's given us, let's have a look from 200 pixels here to about 3,002 here. Okay, we're fine. We've got about 2,400 pixels. That's a lot. That should be enough for your magazine front cover, and it should be enough for any other smaller uses of that font afterwards. Now, we have to think about manipulating this font from here on out. So now we need to think about what we're going to uniformly do to this font. Now, at the moment, it is still text data. In the bottom right hand corner you've got a T for text box, right? Now that means that we can still add letters to it. We can just sort of go to the text layer down there, get our cursor, type between two. We could even call it top kite, not that you'd want to, but the point is it's still editable as letters. And we need to make this so that it is image data and then we can start to edit that. Now there's one exception is that we're going to potentially, if, it, if you want to do something like put a stroke around it that you know you're going to put around it, then it m now might be a good time to do it because a stroke 
which is a uniform line across whichever text is in the text box can be something you do very early on so if we select that up there for example um, then we can find we will have just the effects box down here and click on stroke now we did a stroke before and we saw that we would be drawing a uniform line say around our barcode but here if we change the size of the stroke, and I, I don't advise on doing anything like drop shadows or anything. I don't know if you can see this here with the drop shadows and the inner shadows and things like outer glows and inner glows and whatnot. I don't know how well you can see that, but certainly you can see the inner shadow turning up. Um, that gives things like a sense of sort of being set down or sort of carved into the surface by giving it some sort of relief here. Don't use inner shadows. Don't use drop shadows. You've got to really want to use a drop shadow, to be fair. Certainly no glows. Stroke is something that's very popular in terms of a modern convention. And you can see that we've got a black line here around all of that. And it's a 10-point black stroke. Now, if there's something you want to do where you want to make the font a little bit uniformly bolder, then you can click on maybe the same color that it is. And I'm using dead white, right, because I've got a white font. And I'm just going to make it a little bit more sort of bold and sort of fun looking by giving it a little bit of a stroke now before I move on. All right. Uh, so that's a good way of making things bold from the outset. If you don't have a bold font, that's how you can make things bolder. But it's still text and it will keep applying the stroke as I go. If I type another E back in there now, it will make that a fat E. Right. So let's go and turn that text into image and then we're going to start moving bits of the image around to make this look like a tighter brand here is arguably the most difficult bit of the process that's going to take the most layers so i'm going to go and get my text layer here and press control and i'm going to duplicate the layer right if I know I'm going to go and do something that's kind of game changing, then I don't want to destroy my original data that I've got in. I know I've got my font. I know that I'm happy with the stroke around it, but I do want to be able to edit it. So I'm going to go and call this top kit to edit, right? And I'm going to put that there and you're going to see that I've now got two layers. One's called top kit. One's called top kit to edit. And I can make the top kit that I originally got in. I'm just going to go and make that invisible by clicking on the little eye icon in the bottom right hand corner so what i'm going to do is get this one to edit and i'm going to start editing it and the best way to edit text and turn it into image so that it's there for like a universal uh, logo as such is by control clicking and i'm going to rasterize type now that's exactly like we had last time with the smart objects we got in the smart objects where we dragged in you know, a new barcode from the uh, internet and we rasterized it. And rasterizing turns stuff into flat image data to mess around with. So we're no longer able to type. And what you will see, and you can't really see it at the minute on here, but, but it is there in the bottom right hand corner in the layers, is you've got that image data. So whereas the green, you can see a little thumbnail there, and down here in the thumbnail, it's saying top kit just as image data. Now, this is why our green background is really important because at the moment, if I get rid of my green background, it's white on white and gray and it's horrible. So let's go and put our green background back in. That's why we have it. Right, so what we need to go and do, now this is image, we need to separate off each of the different letters because I personally want to move my letters slightly closer together. When you're in something like InDesign, you can deal with things like letter spacing. But when you've got logos and you're trying to change letter spacing, you're trying to maybe put things on the angle or cant it in some way, it's a very image-based uh, program. And it's, it's also a much more sort of visual way of doing things. Then we need to go and separate these different letters up as layers right and this is how I'm going to do it and then I'm going to run you through in a kind of a quick way of how we would do it and then I'm going to show you how to push them all together so let's go and get top kit to edit and I'm going to use my marquee tool in the top right hand corner and I'm going to grab up my T right just my T there and I'm going to go to the top and I'm going to go to layer new layer 
via copy. Now that's a good way of doing things, which says whatever is on the layer that I'm working with, which is all of top kit in white, and I'm just going to get the selected bit that I've marked up, just the T, and it's going to make me an area that's just the T on a new flat pane of plastic. So let's go and do layer via copy. Now I'll show you that's worked by going down here and getting rid of top kit to edit. And then we know that we've got our visible layers. So down here in the bottom right hand corner, pay attention to the cursor. We've got the top kit as text, which we can't see currently because it's been made invisible. There it is, it's visible. There it is, it's gone because it's got the eye icon missing. Then we've got top kit to edit as a rasterized image layer. We can't see it because it's got the eye icon missing and we put it back and there it is and it's gone again, right? Because they're all white, they look exactly the same, those two. But with layer one, we've made a new layer via copy of just the T that we selected. And one thing we do need to do is go in, double click on that, and just call it just T, right? Name your layers, super important. So what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna go through um, with some comedy music and grab up just my S, just my um, other letters, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, and put them all on separate layers. So then I can move them as I see fit afterwards. Here comes the funny music. So now we have our separate letters. So if you have a look down here in the bottom right hand corner in the layers pane, we have not got visible top kit to edit, which was just the image flat. And we've not got the, um, the text version down there as well. So all we've got is just the first T, just O, just P, just K, just I, and just T, and I've named them up appropriately. It's super important to do that. Um, I've done it slightly differently where I've actually copied across all of the stroke data as well, but we can flatten all of these afterwards, and I'll talk to you about flattening them. Um, you can flatten them before and then cut them up, or you can cut them up and then flatten them after. Anyway, but you should see that if I just go and get rid of my T, make it invisible, and I get rid of my I and make that invisible, and as I scroll down and get my K and make it invisible and you can see I have control over each letter individually on a separate layer. Now this is where the joy happens. So one thing that's worth showing you as we move on is the ability to move our layer window on the right hand side and move these around. We can move these around as we see fit. All right, but what I would say to you is always worth having a pretty healthy sized layer window. Now that's gone invisible. Look, because my just first T, there we go, that, that layer there, I've accidentally pressed the uh, eye icon. And because I had it named up properly, I was able to go and get that back where it ought to be very, very quickly. So make it longer. I'm going to move that up slightly past my adjustments and then if you move your cursor ever so slightly you will see that you can just drag it out and you get that up down arrow and then you can drag it down like so. And the longer that is the more layers you can see and the more relative space you can see between the layers so you know what the topmost is and you don't have to do so much scrolling up and down. So it's actually very useful to have a nice healthy sized layer uh, pane on the bottom right hand corner. Right, so we've got our just O, our just P, and all of that good stuff. So we've got all of our separate letters with their stroke effects on. Now, one thing I was saying before was about flattening your uh, text first of all. So what we can do is instead of having the stroke there, we want to commit the stroke to each of our words. We could have done this before we chopped up our six letters of our two words. But with this one here, if I just go to control, and then if I go to convert to smart object, 
then it will turn it into some sort of uneditable smart objects. But what we know about smart objects is they are dumb objects. And so I will then go to um, rasterize layer, right? And then what you will find is I won't have that editability anymore, but I'm happy with how thick each letter is. So if I go to just O, I can take the stroke on and off, right? You can see that with my white stroke around my white letter, it essentially makes it bold or not. But with my just first T, as I've got here, that I've now flattened, I can only make that invisible or not, right? So I, I don't have that editability of that, that stroke edging anymore. But that's fine. If I'm happy and that I've got my boldness as I wish it to be, then that is grand. So what I can do with all of those ones there is go through, quickly press Control and convert to Smart Object and go through and go to Rasterize Layer. So you sort of tend to have to make things Smart Objects before you rasterize them. Let's go to Just P and we're going to go to Convert to Smart Object. And we're going to go through to Rasterize Layer. And we're going to do this with all of our individual letters. That's the way I've sort of set it up on this one. If you do have any of that effect kind of text on it, then you need to go through this stage of turning these things to sort of flat um, image data to go and use going forward. It is the best way to sort of commit to it. And the, because we've got those other uh, layers previously, we've, we can always go back. We can always go back to that and start chopping that up again. So the idea is always have layers such as maybe top kit to edit or your top kit text down here in the bottom right hand corner as backups. Really important to have backups because you don't want to start making changes where you're kind of locked into the change um, and then suddenly you realize that you don't want it. So we've rasterized our layer and we can get rid of our T and we can get rid of our I and we can get rid of our K and they're all separate things. So we can also grab up all of those things together. If I hold shift and click from one text box to another. So let's grab T and then I hold shift, then it'll grab O. If I go to K, it'll grab everything all the way to K. If I want to select just layers that maybe I just want to do every other letter, then we can use command. So if I go to T and press command and then P and then command and then I, it won't grab a range. It will grab a selection of layers, exactly the layers that I click on, right? So command curly whirly does every other one or every other two as you see fit. But if you do shift, it will take the range from the first click here to the last click there it will take all of those through there right now here comes the joy of moving things around to give things a much tighter look if i get my t and my o and my p i want to give this sort of top kit this much smaller letter spacing so i'm going to use my cursor keys don't use your mouse your mouse is a blunt instrument for big moves if i go to t and I go to the move tool in the top left hand corner, which is our topmost tool. And I'm just going to use my right click, my uh, right cursor key, and I'm going to move it on a pixel by pixel basis. Now, this is where you want to use your eye. And I'm going to go and get P here. And I want to make that closer to my O. And I've got to use my eye here, because if I do that, clearly that's too close. If I maybe click out to the right by three pixels. Maybe it's still too near. I've got to think about looking for symmetries between my T and my O and my P and my O. And I think that's about right. Now, if we want to move the whole of top towards kit, we can do that because we can hold our shift and we're on P. We're going to click to T. All of those layers have been selected. And then we can press our right cursor key and the whole thing will move across and you can just hold it down and it will go across and this is how we're going to get that uh, main spacing between two letters um, of, of the first and second word correct and we can do the same thing there with uh, kit as well i'm going to move the k closer to the i and the t closer to the i and then i'm going to move those back to see where we want in fact what i'll do is i'm just going to get my i and I'm going to move that left. It looks slightly higher than I thought it was going to be. So I'm just going to budge that down. But maybe that's the vagaries of the font. Maybe that's just going to be 
slightly off like a typewriter might be and that's what gives it that kind of look and I'm going to give my T and I'm going to move that with the cursor keys back of the way and I'm looking to see is the space between the T and the K and the I equal to each other is that going to be the same as what we've got for top as well so I feel like we need to go slightly closer there uh, between our T and our I and we need to go slightly closer there between our K and our I I think that looks about right there but then we can go and get K and I and T we can hold shift to select more than one layer remember shift is that up arrow in the bottom left hand corner and now I can get the whole thing go to move tool I am going to use just for the sake of example my move tool and my mouse and I can move the whole word around because it's image data it is not text data anymore it just happens to be a K shape and an I shape so once we are happy with it and we can do all kinds of things with this right we're happy with our KIT we're happy with our kit we're happy with our TOP we're happy with our top now we can turn these into whole words um, and this is where you might want to duplicate the layers and then make a change to them like so but I'm just gonna move on quite quickly by I'm happy with this for this example I'm gonna get my K and I and T and I'm gonna merge those layers and that's gonna be a kit and then they're gonna make a top so if I go to control and click and then I'm going to merge layers all right don't merge visible because that will merge everything that's visible just to merge the selected layers down there at the bottom all right and that's going to give it's going to call it whatever one of those layers is called but I'm gonna to have to go and double click on that let's just go to OK there click on the name and we're gonna call it kit right kit um, or yeah we're gonna name our layers appropriately and we're gonna to go to T hold shift click all the way to P and we're going to control click and we're going to go to merge layers again it's calling it just P but we will name that top all right we're naming our layers what they are so we can make top invisible we can make kit invisible and now this is where we can start to really manipulate these words in terms of their location in response to each other maybe their sizes but we have made something that is more than the sum of its parts. So now we have our two words that are appropriately spaced. Let's go and really mess with this, right? Now there's a couple of things that I use as sort of go-to things to do for logos that are quite modern things to do. One can be to have them slightly offset maybe. So if we go and get our top layer here, and well, you can use our uh, move tool. We can go up to the top and think about how they could interlock. Now there's a little bit of snapping going on, um, but you can see, but we can use our cursor keys to give ourselves maybe a sense of distance between the P and the serif on the P and the K, because you don't want things to be like this. You don't want things to be like accidentally touching. Like That looks terrible, right? Um, you could potentially do them sort of lined up, but that's not really working. It tends to be when you have spaces between letters in logos, they've really thought about the interlocking sort of equal spacing. So you'll notice there that I'm trying to get them all nice and lined up by having a little bit of like one click here on the left cursor key, one click here on the top cursor key. So we're really trying to create a sense of space and proportion in our logo. And I quite like that actually. I quite like the, the movement from the top left to the bottom right. So if we've got that, um, we then we want to go and save a copy of this that we like, right? Now the way I would do that is I'm gonna go to Shift and I can select both of my words that I've got, kit all where it is, top all where it is. I'm going to press control once they're both selected and I'm going to duplicate layers, right? And it's going to ask me what I want to name them as and I'm going to quickly go in and if it allows me to type them in, no it's not allowing me but maybe I'll just have to skip that part. I've got kit all copy, top all copy. Now you'll see if you know you've got image data that's in exactly the same place you should see that it's slightly ever so slightly like a pixel fatter it sort of doesn't put them in exactly exactly the same place but near as damn it but what I'm going to do is I'm going to get kittle and topple 
and I'm going to make those invisible, right? So as I go up my layers, whatever's foremost to my eye, whatever's closest to my eye is going to be the next latest best thing that I've created. And I'm going to press control on those two layers, kit all copy and top all copy, and I'm going to merge those layers. Yeah, I'm just going to get those two. Kit all copy, and then you'll see now that I've got the whole thing with its slightly interlocking look and we're getting there but it's called kittle copy that's no good i need to, to click on that name and call it um top let's have a top kit uh, interlock final name your layers it is interlocked i am happy with that now this is where i get a chance to go and experiment i can move this around Here's some really cool things that you can do. Don't do all of them. Um, and this is where we can go up to the top and we can go to edit and we can go to transform. And transform is sort of the most common things we do to move something around and edit it. So scale will make things larger and smaller. And we did that uh, a little bit last time, but I think we'll uh, do a bit of that now. Let's go to scale. And with this, it, if we want to change the size of something, then we can grab these holders here, go out to the right, and that will stretch it. That, that's going to stretch it in a horrible way. Uh, but if something you know is a font that you want that wants to be slightly wider, you, that's one way of doing it. It's a bit rough though. Um, the other way, of course, is to go and make something a bit taller. Again, if things are out of proportion, they just tend to look a bit rubbish. So that's no good. So what we tend to do is get out of that not really get involved with that we will go and use transform scale and then we will hold shift as we did last time and that will keep things in proportion if you grab out from the bottom right uh, or the top left you will always keep your horizontals and your verticals in proportion and that's where you want to be all right and what you need to go and do then is let go of your mouse button before letting go of shift because what can happen is sometimes if you hold shift grab out make something bigger and smaller but then let go of the shift button first then it gives it a little bit of a tweak and makes out that you haven't really been paying attention to keeping it in proportion so again keeping stuff in proportion is super important with shift uh, let's just go back very quickly to what we had now transform other things that are really kind of cool to go and do rotation okay now that's allowing you to go and rotate it around a circle yeah, having something maybe on the angle can make it look a bit more informal and stamped on perhaps. That could be pretty cool. Uh, so uh, something slightly out of whack like that can be uh, good. If we go to ESC, uh, escape in the top left hand corner, it'll always reset you back to where you were before. Um, skewing in distortion and perspective. Uh, I'll show you a quick one here for perspective perspective allows things to seem as though they are merging from the distance in some way so if I go and grab from the top here I can make it look it's looking a bit Star Wars to be honest right but I'm moving that top left uh, handle in and then suddenly it's looking a bit like it's emerging um, from that uh, crawl at the beginning of Star Wars all right, and I can press return and I can be happy with that. It kind of gives it a sense of almost being like a low angle shot on it as well. Um, so if you've got like a nice bold font, for example, and you're trying to give it a sense of power, then maybe a little bit of this kind of perspective might do you some good. Now we can always go back. If we're not happy with that, we maybe wanted to see it a bit clearer, but we're not happy with it. We can go to uh, edit, step backwards. If we want to undo things, we can go to undo transform. And after doing an undo, it then becomes step backwards, step backwards. And you can even do step forwards if you want to go, oh, I've gone back a few bits, you know, a few stages too far. But I'm going to do undo transform, right? That's where I'm at right now. I'm happy with my interlocking. I'm just going to go and put it uh, so that maybe it is coming from the, uh, the, the distance, um, but it's not going to be coming from the distance uh, in a sort of low angle shot way. I'm just going to go and maybe put it like that. Maybe it's just emerging this way. There we go. I'm going to press return and it's slightly looking like it's coming from a door on the right hand side. Right, so we can manipulate the shape of our words once they are now words together and interlocks. We can be cool with that. We can also go back to this final word. We can go back to effects and we can start doing new stuff to it. So we can go back to our stroke, for example, and we can put a stroke. It will see the edges 
of whatever your text is and we should really be working in white on something white on greens good black on greens good and you're going to see why that's going to work shortly but at the moment we need to not have a stroke on it we need that stroke to be an option that we can put on later at some point so what we're going to go and do is we're going to start making our canvas a bit smaller because we've got all this baggy greenness at the bottom that we don't want all right so we're going to go back to our white uh, let's go there and we're going to go to the top left hand corner over here and we're going to grab up the area that we know that we want and with a bit of space around it a little bit of redundancy but not too much uh, let's get that but that's fine and we don't need all of this area around here so what we're going to do is we're going to go up to the top edit and we're going to go to image and we're going to go to crop right we're going to crop down to this size here it's taken what we want with the marquee that we've just put around it and we just want this area here so we've got top kit interlock final is our layer over here and we're happy with that but we might as well call it what it is which is top kit interlock final and we're going to call it white right we have a white version of it and I can get rid of my white version on green at any point right that's super important that we've now got this clear that's the logo and it's there and it's finished our logo but we need to now save this in a range of ways that mean that we can use this in different situations we have a white version of it and that's great if you're going to put it on a black background we need a black version of this as well now the easiest way to turn white into black is by first of all duplicating the layer let's go and press control now that would also be right click right so if you've got control on your keyboard you can always use right click if you've got a two button mouse especially on a PC and we can duplicate the layer and we're going to name it appropriately so top kit interlock not white copy we're going to call it black because that's what it's going to become right so we're going to put that down there and we have white and black but we're going to go across to that layer and we've got our we're going to make the last one invisible as well the white version invisible behind it and we're going to go to the top and we're going to go and move across till we get to image adjustments and then we're going to go across to invert all right so there's lots of stuff you can do with image which is the third of the drop down menus where you can adjust colors and brightness and contrast and saturation and whatnot but invert is what we're looking for here so we go to invert it will invert the color it will give the opposite color and for the first time now you can even see that in the little thumbnail you can see the black on top of the white gray background so we've got a black version and we've got a white version right so if we go and use our uh, eye icons right you can't really see the white version because it's covered by the black version which is the higher layer up but we can go and pull the black layer down and you'll see the white version we can move the black layer up and you will see the black version right and we can use our little eye icons to make these visible or not and this is where we want to be and if we know we're going to make another color as well I think or make things with a stroke this is kind of the time that you do it um, so let's have a look at getting maybe our white version all right we've got our white version and our black version and what we are going to do is we're going to start to use our transparency that's at the very bottom of all of our canvas so we're going to go and get a green background and we're going to go and make that invisible for the first time and you'll see if you've got black at the top you can very clearly see the transparency behind it obviously if you get rid of the black and it's just white it's horrendous and really hard to work with so let's go to a black for example and we can see that it's worth making any other layers invisible as well just in case and we're going to go and change the color of this now i'm going to press control or right click and i'm going to duplicate that layer and i'm going to go and call this whatever I want you know whatever I'm gonna go and make it so I might go top kit interlock red stroke so I'm gonna make it red and I'm gonna give it a stroke but I need to know exactly what red that's gonna go and be so I'm going to go to the bottom left hand corner I'm going to choose my colors 
if I'm going to be very particular about what red I want to have by using the bottom left rather than up here in the top right which just tends to focus on uh, the RGB colors what I want to do is I want to have my nice bold red and you can see my hexadecimal color uh, representation of that in digits and that changes as I move through the different colors of red that are available to me now I've got some choices here about how I go and get this uh, particular red that I want um, so I can choose to go up to uh, to uh, another document and get that in and pick that as my color as well so I'm gonna go to OK I'm gonna take that red for now um, and I'm going to go and magic wand up my different letters within this red logo I'm gonna hold shift it's the same process before if you hold shift and you use magic wand it will grab up by color and it will take consecutive areas by color right and I've got my red in the bottom left I'm gonna to go to my paint bucket and I'm gonna fill each of those letters exactly like we did with the shape before and there we go and there is our red and it will go to the full extent of those letters now I can change these at another point that that's absolutely fine uh, but the red is what we want for now and I can go back and I can put a stroke around it say let's go to FX there at the bottom put my stroke on it and I'm gonna go and make it a black stroke but I'm gonna go and make it fairly thick there we go about 10 point that 10 point stroke might be your standard size of stroke so I'm gonna press OK and if I'm happy with that then I can uh, lock that one down by pressing control and I'm going to uh, get that one and convert it to a smart object if I'm happy with it then I can do that or I could duplicate the layer and call it um, top gear interlock stroke variable right so that means that I can continue to have one layer that I'm going to go back and keep changing the color of and keep changing the stroke of because I can leave that one there with the with the stroke or I can click on the stroke change the color of the stroke let's just get like a random horrendous uh, teal color for now so you can see it press OK and you can start to see that I can have different versions on different layers that are all independent so one's got the black version one's got the teal version I might have it named up and say we'll keep this one spare so that I can keep editing it for different situations so I'm happy really with my black stroke with the middle red I'm happy also with my black version without a stroke and I'm also happy with my white version without a stroke so what I'm gonna go and do is I'm gonna save a version of each one of these three I need to have and you need to have a white version on transparent a black version on transparent and maybe a variant color with stroke on transparent in fact what you can even do is you can make one that's got no color inside the transparency but that's a conversation we can have nearer the time if you want to make something that looks a bit more outliney. Anyway, let's go and save one of these for now. Let's go and get our black one. And I'm going to make everything else invisible. So I've got no green background on it. I've just got my transparency. And we're going to save it as a PNG. A PNG file is a type of file that retains the transparency and won't suddenly put white behind this black text. So we're going to go to the top file save as and we're going to save it as a PNG go to format and go down go down go down now we've previously saved things as a Photoshop document if you want to keep all the layer data JPEGs are very standard things to sort of pass around the internet that's quite compressed but we are looking for a PNG now that PNG and I'm going to save my PNG into my uh, magazine project all in fact what I'm going to do at the end of this project is save this whole Photoshop session into my magazine project all and I'm going to go and call it what it is right so I might say top kit masthead be on trans right 
black on transparent that would be fine and go and save that and it'll ask me to insulate it but I'm not really bothered about that press OK and then I'm gonna go across and make my white one visible there it is looks like a dog's dinner right now but it'll be very useful to us file save as and we're gonna go and click on the same file name again but we're gonna change it slightly top kit masthead W on trans and we're gonna make sure we go to PNG as well again keep an eye on those file types and we're gonna save that good now this is a 2000 odd pixel across version which will be good for our magazine but won't be so good for our website because we'll have to make it smaller and let's go and do the final thing but let's we're gonna make a bunch of large ones essentially and a load of small ones and let's go to our black and uh, black and red one and let's go to file save as and we're gonna go down to PNG and we're gonna sometimes look, click it on the file name of other things that I like it and we're gonna call it red uh, so, so call it red black on trans PNG save and all of these things now won't have any of their layer information anymore they're all just going to be there for us to go and drag in to a magazine cover while I'm here I'm going to take the opportunity to go and save this whole project. I'm going to save it in magazine home project all as a PSD file. So I'm going to keep all my layers, right? And so you can see with any luck that you've got your full PSD version going to be in here. You're going to have the red on trans, the black on trans and the white on trans as PNGs as well. Right. We're going to maximize compatibility, let that go, that's grand. So why are we doing this? We are doing this so we can replace our masthead mock-up um, from our magazine we put together in the last session back with this. So let's go across here to our magazine. And we know that this will not do. But we also have a bit of an issue because we know we're going to have quite a chunky masthead that isn't going to be just in a landscape style. So I'm going to go down and have a look for my masthead but because we've named all of our layers we can see it's here and we're going to go and make that one invisible. Right? We now no longer have a masthead. What are we going to go and do with this? We're going to go and get in our new image. Now a way we can do this is by going across to magazine home project all and we got to think about which color we're going to go and use we can change the color a bit afterwards but we know that we've got this red and it's this is generally red that we're going to be in a good position to go and use so let's go and use red uh, and black on trans so we're going to grab that one uh, and there's another way we can import this image we can just drag it in so I can just drag it in like that and it will make a new layer and you can see because we have saved it as a PNG it is clear as you like between the letters and we can start straight away holding shift to sort of move it to make it smaller and because it's nice and big we've got lots of options with what we can go and do with it uh, we can make it smaller and it's going to ask me to place the file and I'm going to go and move that up here and it's not quite um, what's the word it's not quite going to go and match up with what the lean of her head so we might have to think about what we go and do with that it tends to be that mast heads will go in the top left hand corner or they will go in uh, some sort of landscape across the top they don't tend to sit up here like it's not very conventional we, we read from left to right and that's what we see evidenced here now what we could do is we could think about moving this slightly across her head maybe have the top in her hairline and maybe the the kit just off so maybe let's go and uh, go to edit at the top let's go to transform and scale and we're going to have to move some things around afterwards because once you get this in um, you're going to have to think very carefully about what you do and we're also going to have to go and think about perhaps moving our um, banner at the top right and, and things around once you, once you work out what your look is you're going to have to think about what you're going to go and do. All right, so we're going to pop that one there. And we're going to go back and move some of our uh, cell lines around. 
So let's go and get our enigmatic cell lines from the top of the banner and let's go and find our banner as well. That's going to be, and our strap line is going to have to move down. So if I click on the strap line, go to the move tool, and I'm going to have to pop that down below in some way. It's looking a little bit like that's going to have to move. And the cell lines are going to have to move. They're there at the moment. If I get rid of those, that'll be grand. And where is my, ah, that's a shape. There we are, that shape for that banner that's going to have to go. That's okay. The idea is to find something that works with your magazine. And what you'll tend to find is that it's better to put all of the conventions in the template and then not need them than rather have to go and sort of jury rig them afterwards. All right, so we've got our strap line. So the idea is, in principle, we have our masthead for our brand, for our passion magazine, which seems to be some sort of unisex kind of uh, streetwear magazine because top kit's not very feminine it's quite unisex um, so with that um, we're going to go and conclude today's lesson but at least you can see that if we save a clear logo on a PNG that we've manipulated and um, really moved beyond just using fonts from the internet then we can get a really nice looking masthead that will get us in the right position and we can put it in and it will work with whatever image we've got we can move our image of our young lady here as well um, in fact one thing I will quickly do before we go off is I'm going to change the color of it I think we want to go back with color picking it with that color of her buttons and whatnot so I'm going to actually take from there from the uh, dark red and I can do that whole thing again where I can go and magic wand into my T uh, let's go and click my layer. I need my layer. Where's my layer? There we are. Top kit. Ah, look, we're going to have to uh, quickly press control and rasterize the layer because it's made it a smart object just by dragging it in. We're on that layer. We can go to our magic wand. We can click on our T, hold shift, and we we'll click on our O, and our P, and our K, and our I, and our T. And we're going to go and make it that uh, dark red color we had from the other cell lines by using our paint pot pop and pop pop and we will find we have something that is very tightly branded and if we're not sure what our red is yeah for that particular uh, color we can see it's nine four one nine one seven and it might be that you literally have to go and write these things down but suddenly um, we've got ourselves a magazine cover and we're going to have to add our cell lines we might end up moving her a little bit to the uh, left as well these little composition things let's just use my cursor keys on her um, with a little bit of a move tool yeah and these little things are going to bump me bump her down slightly now we've got a bit of green back but that's okay we can go and uh, add a little bit of uh, white in afterwards just by doing a, a quick color pick so we can just grab up a layer there and make a layer, new layer, and we're just going to call it uh, white top fill. We can always merge it afterwards. White top fill, and we will do a color pick using that one there against that white. So we want it because not all whites are the same, and uh, we can then go and fill that in with our paint buckets. Let's go put that one there, and who knew? Right, so there's a nice clean white top that's off of her head and we can start putting our cell lines in. Right, so that's the importance of your logos. That's how you get them in as mastheads. Don't type your mastheads, go and design one up, go and bring it in as a PNG and you will have something that's much more authentic and original.